Hey, this is Christian Buckley with Collab Talk, and we're here talking about today's Collab Talk Tweet Jam. So, we're talking about opportunities in the Microsoft ecosystem, and specifically as being a partner in the Microsoft channel. And I've got Sharon with me. Hey, Sharon. Hey, I'm Sharon Weaver. I'm the CEO of Smarter Consulting. I'm an RD and an MCT and all kinds of other letters, and I'm also a Microsoft partner. So, this is very relevant to me. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's funny. So I've been doing these uh, for almost nine years now. And generally, July, for those that aren't as familiar with the Microsoft ecosystem, every July, they have their partner conference. And of course, this was going to be my 11th year in a row of attending, getting ready. I was excited to drive down to Vegas. And it uh, yeah, it was just, it, it's a beautiful drive from where I am. It's not that far here, um, like five hours, maybe, but beautiful parks on the way down. Um, but of course, COVID happened, uh, and so it all went virtual. And uh, so we'll talk about some of what we think got left out, what what we're missing from having a virtual. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it, it, we always have the the a topic that's partner related in July. So it's great, Sharon, the, to have you join me, and let's kind of recap what we talked about online. So Sounds the good. first first question we kick things off with. So what are your key takeaways? from this year's Microsoft Inspire Conference and or the related announcements? Because there's always announcements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think across the board, you know, it's kind of reading everybody's answers and um, across the board, it's just, you know, everything's headed to the cloud. And I think that, you know, we've kind of been hanging on to some on-prem stuff and there's been a lot of, well, we're gonna have another version and we're gonna have another version. And I think every single thing is more about just embracing that cloud is here, it's here to stay. It's, it's gotten beefy enough to be considered kind of solid under your feet. So as a partner, you know, you really need to kind of embrace that and start building your business models around that idea. Yeah, that's actually, there's the, it, it, part of every year as well, there's uh, always announcements around uh, various tools and messaging and resources that Microsoft makes available. And it just, uh, is not me or is it getting better? <laughs> Microsoft is, is getting better at the documentation. I think there's fantastic I think so. tools that are out there, and especially since Microsoft a couple of years ago woke up to, uh, it's like, oh, adoption and engagement are important. And training. And, uh, right. And There's a training center and everything. But they've just started producing fantastic content. Now, I think there's a lost opportunity there for partners to create a lot of that that but obviously there's Microsoft can't do everything. There's industry specific opportunities. You there's have client to go, specific. Right. Well, there's also, you know, we have our deep expertise and our experience in, in the, uh, mm. uh, in the channel and out in various industries and with different clients. And, and so you want to go and tailor that Microsoft content that make it relevant for your customers. So. No, I definitely don't. I mean, I think what they've done has been great from both a generic standpoint and it gives us somewhere to start. But even like as a partner, if I'm promoting something within an organization, I'm going to tailor it more to what they need. Or if I'm training them, I'm going to narrow it down and use screenshots out of their environment. I'm not necessarily going to use all the Microsoft stuff anyways, but it gives me a really good place to start. One thing, one takeaway that I had from this, uh, uh, the, and we'll talk about this a little bit later with some of the other questions, but you know, how... Uh, incredibly difficult it is to have an ad hoc, uh, uh, you know, uh, discovery of other partners. I mean, you, you're not walking across an expo hall and see somebody that you've not seen for five, six years, strike up mm -hmm. a conversation next thing, like, hey, we should partner together on something. Like, it, it's much more difficult to do that kind of thing. There, there were a lot of, um, you know, side rooms, sidebar comments that are going, conversations going on. One other takeaway, though, is they had all the animal cams. So did you participate in any of those, dude? I did it. And that's actually, I mean, one of the big things for this year, I think, from a thematic perspective is I'm just so slammed that I'm trying to squeeze it in, you know, because because guess what? I didn't leave my house and go to a completely separate environment. I know this is going to shock you. I still tried to do things during the event. And so I ended up watching things after instead of keeping on track with everything, which was a big difference. And it's, it's uh, yeah, it made for long days. I mean, one, one thing is there were a couple sessions, which I, I cannot miss this. I wasn't able to watch it the first run, but they, uh, uh, most of the core, certainly the, the keynotes, but all the core topics, they repeated three different times 
so that they yeah. had people from other time zones that were in there. And of course you could go in and have the conversations and connect with people throughout, you know, uh, each of those time zones. So that was a nice feature. But again, I go back to like one of the, the biggest benefits of attending the Inspire conference had nothing to do with the content being shared. Like I would go to the keynotes and I, I think in the decade of attending that conference, I think I've gone to two sessions other than the keynotes um, after uh, all those years because I spent all of my time in the expo hall, in the country lounges, Absolutely. setting up meetings, connecting with people, um, talking with the product teams. Um, yeah. And well, you can watch I'm, things that are recorded later and get the information out of them. What you can't get is that interaction with people. Right. Okay, the question two, this pertains specifically to Satya's, uh, the, the phrase that he was using in his keynote on day two, but how is your tech intensity and how well are you or your customers weathering the current global economic climate? Yeah, so luckily one of my anchor clients, um, we spent uh, the bulk of 2019 migrating them from on-prem to 100% virtual and Office 365. Um, and what's really interesting about them compared to some of the other clients that I have is that we had completely migrated them and in January we were doing training and we were kind of just tying up some loose ends. And when COVID hit um, and they were forced out of the building, they shut down everything, they sent everybody home, within a few days, we were all back to being fully productive in that group because they were already using Teams on a regular basis. They were already using Office 365 on a regular basis. And so they had already put in that equity um, to make all of that happen, um, as opposed to other people that I feel, um, you know, in, in that change were kind of, they moved out and then they went, oh, um, here's all of the things that were not connected and were not moved over that we need to think about. And they were spending a lot of time kind of playing catch up. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard. And so in tech intensity as well, uh, uh, Satya described that as being kind of the evolution of business transformation. I think you're right. It, it forced a lot of companies, uh, forced their hands to, to say, hey, what does this actually look like? We've never experienced it to this degree. What's missing? What's lacking from this? And so I'm sure you had a lot of policies been, being written kind of in real time and, yes. uh, and people realizing you know, and, and those of us that have worked remotely for years have realized that, you know, how reliant we are on bandwidth and all those other issues. There's a sunspot and it goes down. I mean, I went down just before the tweet jam this morning, lost my internet connection. Oh, no. I've got, I've got gig speeds here. And I'm like, everything just dropped out and like, what's going on is freaking out. It was only down for two, three minutes, but it was enough to interrupted things. And, you know, it, it, it's enough to, uh, knowing I've got a full day, kind of, kind of, freaked me out there for a second. But uh, as far as that transformation, I think that the level, the intensity that Satya talked about in most organizations, it's increased because mm -hmm. they've, you know, they, again, they had to, they had to react to this and figure out, hey, we're going to be, we may be doing this for a lot longer than we had a, a planned. We need to put in the right policies, make sure that we have the right technology. Uh, and, and so it's, uh, you know, People have been turning the burners up, uh, going at uh, faster speeds. And even people who are not working remotely are really starting to pay attention. I've got clients that are back in the office that are just like, we need to get this solved because we've got stuff to do and we've got we've got people that need to go home and we've got clients that are at home. And, and so they're, they're, I think, feeling that, that need for that as well. And so I think, you know, when we look at tech intensity, I think, it's at kind of a really high level right now. Yeah. You know, I used to joke that, uh, you know, again, working remotely, but with everybody else working remotely, uh, you know, that there's <laughs> the meetings have been spread out, but it's like, um, I, 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 generally I'm online. I'm on a first call sometimes like seven in the morning, generally by 8 AM. Some days it's solid. I, I'm until like, three or four in the afternoon, just solid back to back to back solid meetings. And yes. as I was, I say to my wife, it's like, she's like, you know, what does your day look like? I said, well, I've got like seven meetings after which I have to then get to work. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, that's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to do that. You have to be, uh, it's kind of like with productivity 
where you have to be uh, more selective about those things. Say, what do we really need to accomplish? And uh, schedule shorter meetings. I think that's one important lesson that's yes, been learned. We definitely do that. We short we schedule shorter meetings. I, you know, it's really funny because I've been working from home for a long time as well and been very virtual for a long time. And one of my big things is I always kind of ran through lunch. You know, I'd grab a snack and I yep. keep working through lunch. And um, with everything kind of changed the way it has, I'm taking a lunch break every day because I have to stop staring at a screen for a certain amount of time or my head's gonna explode. So I stop at lunchtime and I literally leave my office and I go outside and I eat my food and I sit and on my deck and I relax for a little while and then I come back in and I have never taken a, a proper lunch probably in almost 10 years. Yeah, I, so I just ate 30 minutes ago, it being <laughs> almost 4 p.m. Uh, but I, yeah, I, 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 I always say that it's a win if I'm able to shower before 1 p.m. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of, roll, kind of rolls into question three. So have your operations and or priorities changed, if at all, during the current global economic climate? So has it changed yeah. the way that you guys operate? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of turned us on our heads, right? I mean, like, because normally I spend a very large amount of time traveling and speaking at events and speaking at conferences. Um, I do on-site training. Um, you know, and I spend a lot of, I, I go to a lot of even local events. So if you think about user groups or um, uh, committee meetings or um, any of those types of things, right? Um, we're so used to kind of running to all these different places and seeing different people and the travel that's involved with that. Um, and that all just kind of stopped. And even though we have some virtual events and we have some virtual um, connections, it's, it's nowhere near the same. We're not getting the same um, reach that we were getting that way before. We're not building the same connections. We're not meeting people in different markets the way that we were. Um, people are not kind of coming out for a couple of hours and, and having coffee or, or grabbing lunch with us or things like that anymore. Um, and so we're having to definitely be a lot more intentional about every single thing that we do. We, we put together you know, a better marketing strategy and a better branding strategy. We, a better communication plan. We've got way more touch points than we had before. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely completely changed the way that we interact and interface with not just our leads and potential clients, but our, our day-to-day -day clients as well. Like I'm constantly making sure that I'm touching and talking to them and, you know, catching up with everybody somewhere. That's an important distinction too, is that, you know, in, in asking your partners and, and your customers you know, is this enough? Are you getting the information that you need? Like I, you know, we were on site, you know, at least once a week before, and I've not seen you in three months, four months. Um, what else could we be doing? And, and that's an important aspect, I think, of, of, of all of this internally, as well as, you know, externally uh, with your partners, ha having that conversation on a regular basis of what could we be doing differently? How can we improve on this? Um, uh, because I, I still believe that there's a lot of people that are just like, we're almost through this and it's, and it's almost back to, to it normal. And it's like, I don't think so. It's going to be changed dramatically, if not just permanently, you know, across the board. Um, and, and so we need to, uh, so you need to be communicating about, Hey, this is what else can we do? I think it will go a long way. And that, of course, the priority is for your business um, as you were, uh, mentioned, um, not being able to go out and drive leads that way, you have to get creative. And it means that through the traditionally, you know, virtual ways of reaching out, connecting with people, but so are all of your competitors because that's all that they can do. And so it yeah. makes it very crowded and noisy. Um, I, I mean, going and running, increasing your spend, your ad spend on Facebook and LinkedIn or Twitter, whatever, wherever you're doing that, um, you've got to be, get a bit more creative. Well, and on top of that, I'll tell you another kind of thing that happened that I really didn't even realize was happening. Um, but we identified in one of our last meetings that our target, our target audience changed and we didn't even know that had happened. So we simply converted what we had been doing in person to more of an online presence and more of a communication presence. And what ended up happening is we started getting a really large influx of small and medium sized businesses. Uh, whereas before I had been pretty heavily medium to large sized businesses, 
all of a sudden, all these little small and medium sized businesses started coming out of the woodwork and saying, I need help too. Yeah. Well, I mean, of and course, like, they, of course they're, they're using the same stuff. They, they need the same right. help. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it was really interesting seeing that that kind of pulled some additional um, audience out of, of that stuff as opposed to more the group I was used to working with on a regular basis. So, I mean, it's not, it, it's a great thing, just definitely different. Yep. Well, question four kind of touches on uh, uh, the, the primary themes of, of the event and the, the, the keynotes and, and Gabriella talked about it, Satya talked about it. Question four is Microsoft partners, how are you focusing on remote work business continuity, security, and or cloud migration. So those are kind of the four big categories. I know, so two, <laughs> two people that are in the collaboration space, and I made this point this morning as well, is why it would be nice to have the diversity of Azure people on and kind of other areas within the Microsoft ecosystem, but the collaboration folks, like we do, we've been doing all four of those things our entire like, careers, is, right? Yeah. Are, are people doing stuff other than that? Like I, I didn't, is, is there another option? I mean, I kind of feel like as a Microsoft partner and I, if you're not already in that space and you're not already doing that, I'm surprised first of all, and there's a lot of catch up that's going to have to happen. And I think if you want to get into that space, just like everybody else did, you're going to spend a lot of time on training and a lot of time on reading and a lot of time on researching to really understand, you know, kind of what's out there and also just diving in, right? So a lot of this is just, I download things and I turn things on and I start clicking buttons and then I go watch the video to make sure that I know what's happening. And I've gotten comfortable with a lot of those types of things because we've been using them for so long. And now I feel like it's kind of our job and our obligation to now help people kind of come over and say, Hey, we've been doing this for a while. It's good. It's safe. We know how it works. Let me help you get over here too. Right. Well, you know, I made a comment. So on the cloud migration side of that, cause that, that's one where I, I, I think that I think with all four of these categories, of course, there are going to be some people that feel that they, their hand was kind of forced. They need to go and react to this. The cloud migration is something that, um, Honestly, I don't, I don't remember the last time I ran into a company that was on-prem only. It's been a couple of years since I've run into one. I'm, and I'm sure they exist that, that are out there. And, they do. I know uh, some. But yeah. Right. They're, they're I think hi hybrid. Fewer. Yeah. And hybrid, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's going to be, hybrid's going to be around for a long time. Um, you have a lot of the born in the cloud, you know, uh, providers. But I think that more and more what's kind of, uh, and this kind of fits in with business continuity as well as the migration, where I think this is again, forced a lot of companies to go and look at every aspect of their business and say, where are we falling down? And so there might've been areas where, um, I'll just use a generic example, like in you know the, the larger organization with an HR team and the support that they provided, a lot of this stuff, you know, and they work very closely in person together and the, the vendors that they use and the services that they provide to the company, they're just used to being that in-house, in-person you know, capability yep. and to go and yep. move a lot of those other uh, operating systems in and to make sure the, the, the business is able to run smoothly and people are paid on time, they get the, the benefit questions. And, yep. um, you know, it's, uh, it's just a, it is a very different way of, of working. This isn't just a hey, everybody, we're going to be working remotely for a couple of weeks. So kind of take your laptops. Oh, you don't have laptops, some of you? Um, <laughs> take your PCs. Uh, we right. actually had a client who literally was checking PCs out yeah, from their Yeah, a few companies that have done that where I know other companies that have said, hey, here's dollars, go and buy whatever you need that's mm -hmm. missing from your yep. home office. And so somebody went and bought uh, a, a new camera and a mic and light set up with the money that was uh, that was expended so that and, and, and you're, thinking about, chair. you're thinking about like VPN loads for the business and you know can what we have support the amount of users that are trying to access things and and yeah and I think a, a lot of this kind of getting to that um, that whole digital transformation which we've been talking about for years is more than just it's cool that we have cloud stuff it's how does this encapsulate all of the needs that we have? And, and it's not an overnight type of thing. It's, there's a lot of different areas that have to be considered and tested and trained and governed more than anything. Yep. Well, it's, it's, uh, I, I know that I, again, for the stuff that I do, the stuff that you do and for your clients, 
again, we touch on all those different areas. I mean, remote work is just the nature of the technology that we're experts on that we've been working with for decades, um, but helping train people on what that actually means. The business continuity is, I mean, that's, that's a, I always had this conversation uh, around um, backup um, mm-hmm. and, and archiving and people think, oh, to back up the disk. It's like, well, there's a difference between having a backup um, strategy in place or a plan in place versus business continuity, which is, Absolutely. you know, Hey, we've got the tape backups or whatever. Now what? Yeah. What actually <laughs> happens? And do you have SLAs in place with your clients? Like w- what if you're out for two days? What, how long does it take to restore those services? And how does that, you know, and what happens to the stuff that's happening while you're getting the backup restored? If it takes four five, six days and the, there's right. still work happening. Right. It, it's it just, it's a very different plan. It's, it's uh, funny. It makes me uh, think back to conversation when I was, uh, you know, part of the early office 365 team and uh, my good friend, Mike Watson, uh, you know, it was uh, one of the engineers on the team and we were sitting and talking and, and I asked it, I said, do we have a plan for, for backup and for uh, uh, business continuity? And he, uh, and he said, you know, I don't think I've seen one. And we both went and looked, he's like, we should write that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I'm just like, I, I came in, that was about a year into the team being in place. And I was amazed that that didn't exist. But yeah, mm-hmm. you know, that's why they hired people like me to do that. But, uh, yep. but the next question was, uh, how can companies better leverage technology innovation to drive business and societal outcomes for good? Yeah, that was kind of a loaded question. There was th- yes. that's a really beefy question. That's like, right. how can we solve world peace using technology? I only use technology for evil. You know that, Sharon. We've talked about it. Uh, that's that's <laughs> my goal. You know, <laughs> you um, know I mean, yeah. I think technology is kind of like money, right? Um, good people do good things with it, and bad people do bad things with it. I mean, that's really what boils down to it. Technology right. is just a tool that people use to do things and to solve problems. And so, I mean, I think number one, you have to identify like what is it we're trying to accomplish? What's the pain point? What are we trying to solve? And how are we going to try to solve it? The technology itself does not do anything. The technology simply helps us to you know more efficiently solve an existing problem in a way that makes sense. Right. Right. No. So I think to do good things, you have to have good goals and you have to say, okay, what is it that we're trying to accomplish and how are we going to use our technology to get to that end goal? And I know one of the big topics right now is ADA compliance. Um, And what's really interesting is um, I went to school and in my web design class, we had a blind guy. Yeah. In web design, Hmm. um, (laughs) which was a really neat experience because I got to learn not only, you know, how he used the tools to, you know, consume the material, but he was also designing with it as well, which was a really interesting concept. Um, And then I had a quadriplegic in my cohort for my bachelor's degree program um, and that I uh, partnered with several times on different projects. And what's really interesting is that made a humongous mark on me. Like I really learned a lot from that experience. And then when I started training on SharePoint, I started teaching people about the ADA compliance features that are in all of Microsoft products and how to use those to make sure that what you're doing is not only solving the business problem, but is also accessible to the people around you. Um, so it's just a big platform of mine. If you want to really be able to make good in the world, you know, don't just think about the the problem you're trying to solve, but make sure that you are thinking about the problem holistically. Right. Well, I think there there are so many opportunities. It, um, so uh, you know, Tracy Vanderskip and I have talked about. Uh, for those that don't know Tracy, she's she's awesome. Um, her company, the Guid Stuff. Crazy awesome. Um, uh, she's out of uh, the uh, Johannesburg, South Africa area, but she's really into motorcycles. And we've talked about, we're just trying to find, like, get the timing right. We were hoping to do it this year, then this COVID thing happened. But to come over and get a bunch of people to sponsor her, and Microsoft, Jeff Teeper had already said, hey, I would totally sponsor that. Uh, and basically, she would ride around the Western United States and go to uh, some of the reservations and underprivileged areas and teach kind of technology 101. That's One so of the things great. that we can do, yeah, it's, it's go to some of these underserved areas and, and give back directly to those communities. I mean, there's, there's marketing dollars that are out there. It's not necessarily even dollars that need to be spent, time needs to be spent. You know, yeah. Give back our expertise on these technologies, help them understand what they can do in low bandwidth areas, the tools that are available for free, um, 
you know, the resources that are available to them. There's so many, this is something else that's been uh, kind of come out of this, uh, this, this dark period that we're in, um, of all of the training resources and opportunities that are out there, great content, online learning programs, a lot of them that will waive the fee or they've made the programs free. You can go to edX, you could go into the, some of the lynda.com content through LinkedIn and other resources. I know Pluralsight has some capabilities, a mm -hmm. lot of training companies that have these resources out there. It's been, you know, it's a veritable cornucopia of it, opportunity out there. Tons around. of it, tons yeah. of it. And, and so I think we, we need to do more, step it up and help people to understand that it's out there. A lot of times, one of the most common questions I hear as an MVP and RD is like, how do you keep up with everything? And the reality is that none of us do. We rely <laughs> on each other. Yes. And it's more, it's about that community. So the more the people that we can get plugged into the community and that we share, hey, this is where I go for, for news and updates around what's mm -hmm. happening with technology. Here's the training resources. Here's the people that I follow, the blog posts, the podcasts, the video series around this and share what we've learned and what we know, I think is one of the best things we could do. Maybe that's the way to answer this. I would answer this is share more, look for opportunities to share. Don't wait for somebody to ask. Yes. Be proactive in your sharing. Yeah. And, well, and I think people are always asking kind of what's next and where can I go for information and, and, and what can I get? Um, I know one of the things that we've been doing on my team is we've created, we're starting to create these little short video tech tips um, where we're just like, Hey, here's a common problem I had and here's how I solved it. Um, every time I, every time any of my employees come to me and say, Oh my God, I have to show you this. I'm like, turn that into a tech tip. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Well, I, I, we were talking about it. Like, I would get a list. I have a to-do list of all of those ideas. Yes. It, it gets longer, faster than I can take oh, anything geez. off of that I, list. I know. I can't keep up with them. But yeah, absolutely. That's when you have to prioritize those things. But, um, all right. Uh, last two questions, I think, are really big questions. Really kind of the, the, the meat of where this, uh, the Tweet Jam today was, was going. Um, so the sixth question was, is Microsoft Partners where do you see the greatest opportunities for growth in the next two to three years? And I was looking for specifically, you know, like the technology areas where you really see like some of those opportunities. So I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's kind of two answers to that, right? There's, there is from the technology perspective, you're going to start talking about things like the growth in teams and Azure in terms of bots and AI and things like that. Um, and, uh, and I think on the other side, from the more soft and squishy side, um, you know, I was thinking more in terms of education, um, change management, um, support, like just in general. So you think about migrations and helping the back to that tech tips thing, right? Um, I think, you know, there's the technology that has been there and is only getting better. I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's, you know, changing in terms of there's a lot of new technology. I just think we're kind of building on the stack that's been out there for a while that's really getting mature and really doing a lot of cool things and, and, and able to do things that we want to do with it. Um, but I think now what's happening is we've, we've kind of gotten past a little bit of that initial adoption hump where people are all starting to kind of dive into it and they're coming back and saying, okay, I've got it. Now what do I do with it? You know, so it's things like training people on what they can do past the 101 stage. It's understanding how they're going to use it to solve their problems. It's supporting them to finish up getting from here to there or consolidating or understanding which license levels they need to be on. Um, I probably spend half of my calls um, with users who are saying, well, you know, what do I need to do about this? And I've got these four products and what's the right thing? And how do I connect this, this, and this together in the cloud? And what makes sense from an architecture perspective? So I think, I mean, I think the biggest opportunities are really going to be around tying the business process to the technology in the cloud and making that work as efficiently as possible and as economically as possible um, to help all of those businesses from kind of getting into sprawl of any sort um, so that they can afford what they've got and it's solving their problem and they know how to use it. I think you mentioned everything you just described, yeah, right. It's where you can understand all those pieces, understand what your business needs, understand the new technology that's coming out. But if you are really bad at change management, because one of the, I think, biggest opportunities for partners, and it kind of touches kind of everything you just discussed is the 
rate of change, a rate of innovation, new stuff that's coming out. It's, uh, I mean, there are Microsoft people that are complaining like this just is so fast. <laughs> there's so much that's coming out. It seems like every week there's announcements of something that touches on, and when you're using kind of the full stack and in different product areas across Microsoft, and it's a constant, you know, flood of change that's coming in. And organizations that can, can get good at that change management process, seeing what's new, understanding, okay, hey, here to assess, here's what we think the impact will be, here's our strategy for rolling this out, train everybody on that. I mean, yeah. there's there's tremendous opportunities for trainers, for you know, consultants to go in to help automate and all those kinds of things, but um, having people that are uh, you know on the inside, your business analysts, your project managers, if you've yes. got change management specialists um, that can own that, it's the overall governance of all of these moving parts that is going to be so critical to success going forward. Well, it's it's the idea of being proactive instead of reactive. You know, we've been reactive for so long in technology because, you know, a lot of times that's what you end up with. I've had the system forever and I went through, you know, whatever the last crash was. And so I'm just reacting to that and I'm just continuing to keep that going. Well, guess what? In the, you're kind of in a, a do-over where you've got the opportunity to set it all up right at the beginning and to be proactive. So why not take that opportunity right now and plan ahead? It, you know, in the last question here, uh, and, and I was actually, I, I know that there were, uh, I know firsthand that there were a couple of Microsoft people that were lurking and really were interested in this question, but what advice would you give to Microsoft to improve their support for or interactions with partners? And uh, no one responded for like four <laughs> minutes. I know, it's just Nothing. like sad there. And, and so I went with my one comment and, and I'll, so I'll bring it up again. And a few other people jumped in afterwards. I need to go back through the log. And uh, this is the, one of the, the, the beauties of our sponsor for the Tweet Jams of Tigraph is that they provide all the, the analytics around the events themselves and track the last tab in the Power BI stats that they provide. Uh, and I'll provide a link that'll be in the description for the video and on the blog post as well. Um, but it has every single tweet and retweet that included the collab talk hashtag, of course, so they could track it. But so nice. you could actually go back and read at your own speed everything that anyone said during the one hour around each of those questions. But my comment that I made was that, um, and this is something that has come up with all of the online activities that we're doing, all of these events, whether you're doing a webinar yourself or you're doing a, a, a community event where you've got multiple tracks that are going on, the difficulty is that ad hoc uh, discovery process for peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do virtually. And one of the things that I was waiting for from Microsoft um, was uh, through the partner conference, which you've attended, so you know, is the, the Connect tools. And they've mm -hmm. changed a little bit over the years, but they've largely not really met the need of even the in-person meetings or events. Yeah. and and there was no mention of it, no leveraging of that at all this year for the virtual Microsoft Inspire conference. But Connect allows you to go in, you have as a as sales and marketing professionals, as you know, owners of businesses to have a profile, to go in and discover other subject matter experts, the product team people, other vendors and partners, um, just around whatever, go find the thousands, tens of thousands of people that are in the system and then connect to them, hence the name, and say, reach out and say, hey, are you going to be attending the event? You know, can we meet in person? And they had these connect tables, these areas designated for these face-to-face -face meetings. How do you replicate that online? I mean, I, I really was hoping for, um, with first with Build, and then especially with Inspire, and I've provided the feedback again, and I, I don't know what, I know that they're thinking of some other things for Ignite, um, but that was sorely lacking. I think I, I lost you there, you're frozen. Oh, you're back. You disappeared for a minute. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Now it just said, uh, it's telling me now my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, better get us some going help. On. There's so much construction right around here, so who knows what's going on? Sunspots or I mean, it's just uh, it's probably the const the construction. Who knows? But uh, anyway, so my my where I left off. I don't know if you heard the end of that um, was around you know that Microsoft needs to do something about yeah. the connect about community. Well, it's about community. And I mean, so, you know, there's, there's kind of the connect stuff. Um, and it's funny because I was actually in there the other day, I was uh, working with another Microsoft partner and we were talking about kind of teaming up on some stuff. And so we were actually in there looking at stuff. Um, but I've been part of other software communities um, outside of Microsoft that have that kind of sense of here's everybody who uses this or who's everybody who's a partner of this particular tool. Um, and they've got, you know, kind of this community where everybody can kind of hang a virtual shingle out um, and you can see, you know, basically just search through it and you can look for, you know, people who do certain things and whatnot um, that I think have, you know, been much smaller uh, software companies, but have done a really good job of creating that kind of sense of community. I, I definitely think that Microsoft has a lot of opportunity in that area in terms of providing value back to the partners. Um, Cause I know as, as a partner myself, like I feel, I was just saying navigating the partner stuff is like navigating the licenses. Like, you know, it's great that the information's all out there, but the problem is it's so kind of like um, siloed, you know, so it's like, if I want to do this thing, here's this information. If I want to do this thing, there's this information. And there are some things that are paths, but it's kind of like following this weird windy road and you keep figuring out that other stuff is there that had you known that to begin with, you would have gone, done this other thing first. And so the problem is, is you don't know what you don't know until it opens up. And I think it would be really helpful if it was kind of more of a streamlined approach of, you know, if you want to be a partner, here's all the different information kind of up front in one place. And, and while you're going, here are other partners that you can associate with, or you can reach out to, or you can mentor with, or whatever it is, right? Um, so that you can build that community where everybody's kind of working together towards the same goal. Um, but yeah, I definitely think the partner center's got a lot of room for improvement. Um, I think that, you know, training and, um, just materials. I, I noticed this last year, the materials have gotten a lot better. Just like we talked about for the client stuff, I feel like the partner materials are much better than they were before. I'm starting to see a lot of PowerPoint decks that have walkthroughs of do this and then this and then this and then this, and that's been really nice. And there's like been a lot more content, a lot more uh, other resources that are available around the soft skill stuff. Like they've really yes. stepped up their game around. You see more and more around the diversity inclusion stuff, like basic mm -hmm. skills of how to network. Um, and I think uh, the, it's been fantastic for the in-person events, having like the LinkedIn booths that where they'll actually meet with you and advise you on building out your profile yeah. and, uh, and they'll even take a new headshot. I, and, I think they did pictures last year, didn't they? Yeah. The last couple of years that that's been there, which is fantastic. Um, and I also got my LinkedIn socks that I wear a lot. Well, and once so. again, how does that get replicated in a virtual event, right? I know. How do you still get those same kind of value? Was it you that made the comment about there needs to be more, better partner swag sent out? Yes. Yes, it was me. <laughs> it was for sure me. See, I mean, here's the thing. Like, I know that swag is kind of a silly topic, but it's funny because I'm actually on the board of another group and we're putting together a conference for this fall. And one of the things they brought up is, you know, what are some of the things that you guys think would make this better? And I'm like, I think we need to send physical swag because I think it doesn't have to be like a ton of it, but I think people really look forward to the the silliness of the little takeaways. And, and when you don't get anything at all, it's just like, well, okay, that, you know, I, I don't have anything to remember it by. And, and I think for some people, it doesn't matter so much, but I think for some people that cup or, or something they use on a regular basis is a really big deal to them. And you know, they don't, Microsoft doesn't have to just throw money at this marketing without expecting something back. They could actually say, hey, complete this detailed partner yeah. survey. And in return, we'll mail you a, a, a partner package. You know, the, exactly. The well, use it, right? Use it to get your partners to do tasks and, and you know, reward them with, you know, little tchotchkes or things that they can give away to their clients later. Right. You know, it's, uh, it's funny, but if you look at the cost, if you've ever done that kind of uh, uh, research and gone out and, and uh, paid for those kinds of services to get qualified responses to survey, for example, to get that you know, yeah. first and uh, research that data. Um, 
it's a lot less expensive to have a detailed survey, do it yourself, and to send with the mailing cost and the uh, to, to to put all this together. It's a lot less expensive to do it than to go pay for those services and have a third party capture that data for you. But yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Well, it's uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, all good feedback for for Microsoft. Of course, um, you know we're we're in the evergreen model uh, around the partner uh, uh, environment as well uh, within the partner ecosystem. Uh, so it's not like we have to wait for Inspire to happen every July before we can provide feedback to, back to Microsoft. And they are constantly looking at adjusting their, their model uh, and, uh, and are doing a better job. I think Microsoft across the board the last five, six years has proven that they are listening to customers and partners, I still I still argue that they'll they listen to customers first, uh, partners second, MVPs yes. third. Like <laughs> you'd think that we would have like the ear, but I, they you know, Microsoft is so focused on the people that are actually you know paying for software, driving well, business. Never, right, they're looking for they're looking for volume. They like I want I, group think right. If I've got enough people thinking the same thing, then that's probably where we need to head. And so that's a lar the largest group to the next largest group to the next largest group. So I think that's just part of it statistically. Maybe we need more weight. Uh, we our our votes should should uh, be double or triple what the customer votes are. There there you go. Uh, you know, but uh, anything we can do to to feel more special. Yes. <laughs> Well, Sharon, really appreciate your time today. And uh, people want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. How do they reach you? Yeah, just go to my website, www.smarter-consulting.com. All the information's out there. Or you can uh, check out my website at SharonEWeaver.com. And you can also find Sharon out on LinkedIn. Have to throw that in there as well. Oh, yeah, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. You know, just find her. I'm on all the socials somewhere. Find her. Track her down. You know. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks a lot, Sharon, for your time. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely.